Let's turn to the book of Job this morning. Job, the very last chapter, chapter 42. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I don't understand, things too wonderful for me, which I do not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Father, I pray that today we might have a vision of you as Job did, and that we might come to realize how awesome and wonderful you are now, all this time we've been studying your attributes and trying to explain who you are, help us to realize that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface and that whatever we say is too wonderful for us to even comprehend. And so speak to our hearts and make yourself known, Lord, through your spirit, through your word, as only you can. Pray that we would leave this place different today than we were when we came in because we've been in the presence of deity. Pray this for Jesus' sake and in his name, for his eternal glory. Amen. Well, we've been studying and considering the attributes of God, the wonderful and beautiful attributes and perfections of his divine character and nature since the beginning of this year. I'm going to try to kind of bring it all together today and wrap it up. It has been our purpose to try to come to know him as much as is possible for fallen, depraved sinners to do, to comprehend. Um, it's more and more obvious, to me anyway, as I've studied these messages, that we will never be able to fully comprehend who God is on this side of eternity. I mean, I'm thankful for the Bible that makes him known to us. I'm thankful that Jesus came to make him known, but there's only so much awesomeness that you can cram into these feeble little minds of ours that we'll ever be able to understand. And so uh, we know we will be, when he is revealed, the Bible says in 1 John chapter three, that we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And I don't even begin to understand what that verse means. What does it mean that we'll be like him? But anyway, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that we see through a mirror or through a glass darkly, but then we'll see face to face. Well, we know in part, but then when we see the Lord, we'll know as we are also known. These are wonderful promises. Isaiah 57, 15, we studied a while back. Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place with him also who is of a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isn't it interesting that God's purpose is to revive us? And here is Job met the Lord. He said, now that I've seen you, I repent. Repent. Repentance is the first step in revival. It always is. God dwells in the high and the holy place, but also in the humble place. And our problem, I think, is that we look for him in that comfortable middle ground, and that's not where we're going to find him. Romans 11 and 33, oh, the depths and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. And his ways past finding out. And then, of course, Psalm 50 and verse 21, a verse we've been quoting often throughout this series. God says, these things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought, therefore, that I was altogether like you. That was our mistake. He said, but I will rebuke you and set these things in order before your eyes. You see, we, we sometimes talk about theology Theology really means the study of God, but really when it comes down to it, when you go away to school to study theology, what you study is a bunch of theologies. We ought to call it theologyology. 
instead of theology. Theology is the study of God. And you know what? I don't find a lot of that anywhere in churches or in seminaries or anywhere. Where do you go to open up the Bible and study and say, let's find out who God is. Let's try to meet God. Let's try to know God. That's why one of my favorite books of all time was by the great J.I. Packer, who I've quoted so often in this, these months. It's simply called Knowing God. Another wonderful book by uh, um, the guy that was in Watergate. Uh, oh, it'll come to me. It's called Loving God. Loving God. Uh, great book. Why can't I say his name? Anyway, Knowing God. And our study has shown us a couple things that I want to focus on today. Number one, that God is an incomprehensible being. Chuck Colson, that's who it was. Chuck Colson, right? I knew it would come to me. God is an incomprehensible being. Back a few pages in Job here, back in chapter 11 and verse 7, Zophar is speaking. That's a great name, Zophar. Zophar, so good, right? Now, Zophar, he says, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? Are they higher? They are higher than heaven. What can you do? They're deeper than Sheol. What can you know? The measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Can you comprehend who God is? No, of course not. God is incomprehensible. The minute you think you've got your mind wrapped around who he is, you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> As I have prepared these messages week after week after week, each one has seemingly been more and more and more overwhelming. And I'm talking about to me, I, I don't know how you're taking it, but to me, I have just been overwhelmed by what I have discovered and what I've been, you know, thinking about as we've been doing these messages. When we consider God's eternity, his immutability, his immateriality, his uh, the fact that he's a spirit, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, his omniscience. I, I mean, our minds are blown. <clears throat> I mean, our heads are just exploding to try to drink this all in. But God's incomprehensibility is not an excuse or a reason for us to just throw up our hands and give up and say, oh, well, you know, I can never understand that. Give up reverently seeking and searching and, you know, Searching out the scriptures. The Bible commands us to search the scriptures. And in John chapter 5 and verse 39, he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, of Jesus. It's imperative. It is imperative that we draw our beliefs about God from the scriptures. I am so thankful that God has graciously revealed himself to us in the scriptures, aren't you? He's made himself known. And it's be because we cannot possibly attain to the perfect knowledge of God, but that's no reason for us to give up and abandon seeking him, seeking after him. You know, it, it says in uh, John chapter one and, and verse one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then in verse 18 it says, No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who was in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. He has declared Him. God has made Himself known. How gracious is He? To do that. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Never ever give up on trying to seek after God and find God and find more and more and learn more and more of who he is. That was Paul's passion. In Philippians chapter 3, he said, That I may know him, speaking of Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain 
to the resurrection of the dead. Spurgeon, greatest preacher probably this side of the New Testament said this. He said, nothing will so enlarge the intellect and so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of deity. The most excellent study for expanding the soul is the science of Christ and him crucified and the knowledge of the Godhead in the glorious Trinity. He went on in another place in his uh, sermon on Malachi chapter three and verse 16. He said this, the proper study of the Christian is the Godhead. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can engage at the attention of a child of God is the name and nature and person and doings and existence of our great God, which he, God, he calls his father. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in contemplation of divinity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can comprehend and grapple with and then we feel a kind of self-contentment. And we go on our way with thought, behold, I am wise. But when we come to this science of finding that our plumb line cannot sound its depth and that our eagle eye cannot see its height, we turn away with the thought, I am but of yesterday and know nothing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Uh, I abhor myself. I repent in... in Dust and ashes. How feeble and puny we appear when we begin to see God for who he is. The incomprehensibility of God should teach us humility and caution and reverence. And we might learn to say with Job, these are the parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. 2614. John Howe, the Puritan, said the notion that we can hence form of his glory is only such as we may have a large this is hard to read. No notion the notion, therefore, we can hence form of his glory is only such as we may have of a large volume by a brief synopsis or of a spacious country by a little landscape. He has here given us true report of himself, but not a full report. In other words, what we have in the Bible is a true and accurate understanding of who God is, but it's, it's just a tiny little portion, more than we could comprehend. From, that we might be guided thereby from error, but not from ignorance. We can apply our minds to contemplate the several perfections whereby the blessed God discovers to us his being and can in our thoughts attribute them all to him, though we have still but low and defective conceptions of each one. <coughs> Yet so far as our apprehensions can co correspond to the discovery that he affords us of his several excellencies, we have a present view of his glory. You know, if there's any evidence that we need against the doctrine of uh, the theory of evolution, it's the fact that these older guys were so much smarter and, and more articulate than we are. Boy, that's a mouthful. But what he's saying is that what we see of God is just a tiny little speck of who he is. And that's Even that is beyond our comprehension. Uh, lo, again, Job 26, Lo, these are parts of his ways. How little a portion we hear from him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Moses, remember, wanted to see the glory of God. God said, he said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. There's a certain difference between the knowledge of God that we can possess now and that which we will have when we get to heaven. 1 Corinthians 13 and 12, we looked at already. We will see him for who he is. 1 John 3 and verse 2. It's incredible to find, how, just think, think of how incredible it will be 
to finally be in the presence of God and see him face to face. I, I remember um, one of my favorite preachers years ago was uh, a guy by the name of Louis Giglio. I had the opportunity to meet Louis a few times and talk with him. And, and uh, I remember him telling a story about a, a report he had to write when he was in college. He wrote a report on Mount Rainier in Washington State. Are you familiar with that? And, and so he wrote this report and he did all this research and he knew all about its mass and its height and its average temperature and where the tree line was and the vegetation and how big the snow, the glacier was on top and how it was formed and all this. And you know, he knew all these facts about it. One year he said, I was going up to Washington for something and, and we knew Mount Rainier was off to uh, in the opposite direction. But he said, you know, I, I spent all this time writing this research paper on Mount Rainier. He said, I'd like to go and see it. And so they went out of their way and they, they were driving up through the mountains and, and, you know, he was just, you know, talking to his companions about, you know, you know, here's how tall it is, you know, and, and, you know, here's the snow line. It comes down so far and then it goes back up and, you know, the tree line and, and, it, you know, if it were to drop into the ocean, here's what it would displace and all these tremendous facts and interesting trivial information and all this. And he said that we came around this one curve in the road and, and uh, the sign said Mount Rainier this way and, and they were driving through all these beautiful tall pine trees and, and suddenly they came around this corner and over this pass and there it was right in front of them. And he said, wow, wow, that's, that's really, it's really big. It's, and I, you know, it, you know, the average temperature right year round is, uh, you know, 45 degrees, I think, but, and, and the, the tree line goes down, you know, wow. You know, I sometimes hear people say, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this. And I'm like, yeah, you, sure you are. Good. You better write that down because when you see him face to face, you're going to forget everything you ever wanted to know. It's just not going to matter anymore. Even when we get to heaven, we can't think of this. Even when we get to heaven, we still cannot possibly know God as fully as he knows us. We want a God that we can comprehend and define. That's our problem. And if, he, if we could do that, he wouldn't be God. If we could understand him, he wouldn't be God. It's like pouring the ocean into a thimble. Not really. The thimble's too, too big and the ocean isn't even big enough to represent what we're talking about. John Dick was a Scottish Puritan, lived from 1764 to 1833. This is what he said. No dominion is so absolute as that which is founded on creation. He who might not have made anything had a right to make all things according to his own pleasure. In the exercise of his uncontrolled power, he has made some parts of creation more inanimate matter, mere inanimate matter, sorry, of grosser and more refined texture and distinguished by different qualities, but all inert and unconscious. He has given organization to all parts and made them susceptible to growth and expansion, but still without life in the proper sense of the term. To others, he has given not only organization, but conscious existence, organs of sense, and self motive and power. To these he has added in man, the gift of reason and an immortal spirit by which he is allied to a higher order of beings who are placed in the superior regions over the world which he has created. He sways the scepter of omnipotence. I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the armies of the heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none shall stay his hand or say to him, what doest thou, Daniel 4 and 34 and 35? 
What an incredible reality. There's a vast difference between saints being glorified and being divine, he said. To comprehend infinite perfection would require being infinite ourselves. Even in heaven, our comprehension of God will be imperfect. His judgments, Romans 11.33 says, are unsearchable and his ways past finding out. Number two, God is an all-sufficient being. He is an all-sufficient being. In himself and to himself, the first of beings, he could receive nothing from another nor be limited by another. He is infinite. He is possessing of all perfections. As a triune being, he was satisfied to find an object for his love within himself. He wasn't that he was lonely or lacking that caused him to create us, as some have asserted. No, he had no need of anything. He was independent. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him and all things were created and that I'm sorry. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Not to supply some need, but to invite angels and men to come to know his glory. That was his purpose. And to communicate his love and happiness to them, to exercise his goodness and benevolence toward them, to demonstrate his love. He created us that we might be the object of his love, that he might demonstrate his love and thereby glorify himself. Job 22 says, Can a man be profitable to God, though he who is wise may be profitable to himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous, or is it gain to him that you make your ways blameless? He exercises his goodness and his grace to demonstrate his power and glory. He is the supreme object of all of our seeking, and all happiness is found only, only in the enjoyment of God. The old Westminster Catechism said, that the chief end of man is to know God and enjoy him forever. He is the singular object of our joy and affection. Psalm 63, 3, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Lamentations 3 and 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the field, there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Luke chapter 1 and 46, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Do you find all of your joy and fulfillment and contentment and affection in God? If not, you're missing something. If not, whatever it is you're finding it in apart from him, you know what that is? It's an idol. And you really need to destroy it and put your focus on him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Quickly, number three, God is the supreme sovereign. The Bible says in Acts 4 and verse 24, when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord. And they said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and all the sea and all that is in them. Nebuchadnezzar said it in Daniel 4 and verse 34. I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does, he does according to his own will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? A creature can make no demands on his maker. He's utterly dependent upon him. And whatever we receive from him, we must regard as right and just and perfectly appropriate. You know, God can't be wrong. 
You can't do wrong. You can't be mistaken. There was a time, right, and it was just a matter of weeks before you called me to be your pastor here, that I was very discouraged and I was out with a friend of mine. We were out knocking on doors and witnessing and going door to door and inviting people to the church that he pastored that we were attending at the time. And uh, we're walking down the street and he said, you know, God's got a plan for your life. And I said, yeah, I know that. We walked a little further. He said, you know, and his plan is perfect. His plan is perfect. And I said, yeah, I know that. I know that. He said, it's for your good. It's for your good, and it can't possibly be wrong. It's absolutely the perfect right plan. And it was like, you know, he was telling me what I already knew, and he was telling me as it was coming to him, and he was realizing it over and over again. Yeah, but this is, it's perfect, and, and even though it seems like it's a mess right now, and it doesn't seem to make any sense, God knows what he's doing, and whatever he's doing is exactly right and exactly what you need at the moment. And I said, yeah, I know that. I, 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 yeah, I knew that. But at that moment, it didn't feel like it, and it wasn't like it was real. But let me tell you something. It is. It's true. And how many times in your life have you had something go a different way than you hoped or planned or expected, and then you find out that it was exactly right that it happened that way, and it was so much better than what we thought we wanted? Because God is always right. And he's always perfect. And he can't possibly be wrong. No matter what he does, it's right. It's perfect. Because he can't be wrong. Romans 9 and 20 says, Indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to the one who formed it? Why have you made me like this? No. God is just and good. And he always does what is right. And he always does what is perfect. He exercises his sovereignty according to his own good pleasure. Listen, for reasons known only to himself. And by the way, he doesn't owe us any explanation as to why he did what he did. He's just right. Do you trust him? Or do you go like, yeah, that's, he, uh, yeah, but he's, he better explain this to me because it makes no sense. And I better find out what he's got going on here. What he's thinking. I, I, you know, I, I want to know what the story is. What's the backstory on this? Because if he's got a good reason, I sure don't know what it is. And he better be able to explain it to me. Right? That said... We know and trust that God's ways are always right and good because God is good and loving and sovereign. And Romans 8 and verse 28 says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. He orders our lives and our circumstances according to his own purpose, his own good purpose, as it seems good to him. He molds each vessel according to his own uninfluenced determination and perfect design. He has mercy on one while he hardens another as it pleases him according to his own purpose and plan. 21 years ago, Our daughter was born with cerebral palsy and we had her at home because that's what we decided we were going to do. Now part of the reason for that was because we had been told that we couldn't have children. Even though we were praying for children, we went ahead and told the church that they could drop the maternity coverage on our group plan at the church because no one else was of childbearing age and we knew we couldn't have kids. 
even though we were praying for it. So, oh, we of little faith, but you know, and then we went back and forth and why did this happen and why and why and why and when finally Julie said, you know, enough, enough. Enough of this questioning, enough of this second guessing. This is God's purpose and plan for our daughter. In other words, her not being able to walk and talk for the time being, because I still believe God can do anything, is his plan. And there's a purpose for it. And it's right. It's exactly the right plan. This is not some accident or mistake. It wasn't an accident or a mistake when the Messiah came into the world and his own people rejected him and put him on a cross. The fact that God is saving the Gentiles today is not some plan B because plan A went awry. God is in control. I love that song by Babby Mason. It says, God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand and you can't see his plan, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Trust his heart. He loves you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will never do anything but what is good and best for you. Wherever we are, wherever we go, God's eye is always on us. Whoever we are, our lives are held in his loving hand. Now to the Christian, God is our loving father. He invites us to come to him as his dear children. To the unbeliever, he will be a judge and he will be a consuming fire. But even now he pleads, come to me and look to me and be saved. Isaiah 45, 22. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. All you ends of the earth. Why? Because all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And all are under the condemnation of death. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. He is the only supreme, sovereign God. And so I want to close with two verses. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And the 25th verse of the short little book of Jude. To the only God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power and authority both now and forever and ever and ever. Amen. That's your God. Let's pray.